Welcome to the second Dusty Online Seminar of April. Today, I'm pleased of presenting you, um, Professor Preslav uh, Nakov, who's going to talk about fake news and the COVID-19 infodemic. Professor Nakov is a prominent and prolific NLP scientist who leads the Qatar Computer Research Institute. Uh, you may know him because sorry, he... sorry, I don't, I, I don't lead the institute. I mean, the institute has a director. I, uh, I'm, a, I'm a principal scientist there. Okay, uh, yeah. So okay. you're the principal scientist of the Qatar Computer yes. Research Institute, and you may know Professor Nakov because he organized the sentiment analysis task in Semeval and the propaganda detection task in the last edition of Semeval last year. I don't spend more time to our speaker. Um, please, Prof. Nakov, you can start when you want. Thank you very much for the invitation. Do you guys hear me well? Uh, yes. Yes, I'm using headphones so that uh, uh, you know the quality is uh, better. Okay, so let me share slides. Let me see. Um, and uh, let me start. Do you guys see my slides? And yes. uh, do you see them well? Okay, yes. good. So yeah, let me start. Um, it's um, okay. So let's start with something, right? Fake news. Fake news. What is fake news? Okay. Well, is this fake news? Do you guys think this is fake news? Oh, it's coming. The agenda behind COVID nineteen was a microchip. Bill Gates is going to track us and all this. And I mean, I guess that you all would agree that this is this is fake news, right? This is this is something that that is, uh, yeah, uh, some kind of uh, malicious disinformation, and so on and so forth. Now, what about this? Is this fake news? Uh, Trump delays Easter to July 15 to keep promise on coronavirus. I mean, this is something from a year ago um, when uh, he had promised to be done with the virus, the former president of the US, before before Easter, before Easter last year, right? And this is from the Onion. Of course, they're making a joke here. I mean, the question is, is this fake news or not? Well, it really depends on the definition, no? So, um, and uh, certain definitions would say, well, I mean, fake news is about whether something is true or not. Uh, uh, I hear some noise. <laughs> Do this. Sorry. Uh, okay. Yeah, this to is mute, uh, the people. Okay. 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 I think. Yep. Okay. okay. Sounds good. Sorry. So, yeah, I mean, it really depends on the definition, right? But kind of for most, uh, according to the definitions used by most uh, web platforms, uh, this is not fake news. This is protected speech. This is political satire. And this is not something to be subject to, let's say, uh, limiting the spread of COVID-19 related disinformation that many platforms are doing, right? So, um, and, and, and then, you know, people working on, 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 on the problem, right, have, have realized that fake news is not a helpful term because it really misleads people to focus on whether something is true or not, but there's more to the problem than that. And um, if you think of the European Union, the World Health Organization, United Nations, NATO, uh, and so on and so forth, uh, the most fact-checking organizations, they don't, even, even if they talk about fake news to the general public, they're actually talking about disinformation where they really care about the problem, right? And fake news doesn't really have, have a clear definition. It's, it's kind of misleads people to focus on factuality. Disinformation in contrast has a very clear definition. Uh, and this uh, cites slide that I really like from uh, Graf, from Klinka Bardo, from First Draft News. And it shows the two components of disinformation. It's something that is false and it also intends to harm, okay? And, and uh, um, if something is false, but doesn't really have a malicious intent, that's misinformation, right? So I don't know, let's say if uh, I, you know, the, the, the uh, active, the infected cases today in certain countries 110 and they say it's 100, it's not the exact same number, but it really doesn't make much of a difference. That's misinformation. My information is actually when you have real information used for malicious purposes. Um, so for example, in the previous uh, uh, US presidential elections, somebody has hacked uh, in the mail server of uh, Hillary Clinton and has put real emails in the public space. Now this is real information used for malicious purposes. Now, disinformation is something that is both false and means harm. And of course, most, the vast majority of research is focusing on whether something is true or not, because it's, it's kind of easier to fact check, but really, 
the other, the other, and there's much less uh, work on, on the other half of the, half of the problem, intention to do harm. And today I'm going to talk about bot. Uh, I'm going to primarily focus on falseness because this is the thing that is kind of better studied, but I'm also going to uh, touch a little bit on the intention to do harm. And those are equally important, okay? And if you're going to remember one thing from this presentation should be this, okay? That, that this information has two components. It's false and intends to do harm. And okay, so let me ask another question, okay? The first one was what is fake news? The second one is, is fact checking the solution to this information. Um, uh, this is the thing that, that, that people immediately think of, right? I mean, when, when, when we are thinking of fake news, okay, we should, we should go and we should check whether something is true or not. And uh, there have been a lot of efforts in this direction. Um, and uh, there is this nice map at the Duke Reporter Swap that shows that there are about 300 uh, active fact-checking uh, projects around the world, organizations that are doing uh, you know, professional fact-checking, and there are 100 inactive. Um, and then that might sound like quite a lot, right? And it's, it is a lot, and it's great that those exist. Uh, the question is how much has been fact-checked manually? And this is, this is um, um, some statistics that I got from uh, Jesus. They have this um, uh, claims KG, which is a knowledge graph. They have been like, using the, the um, claim review schema to extract uh, information from different fact-checking organizations. And they have been like, uh, parsing them into a knowledge graph. Now let's forget about the knowledge graph and let's only focus on the numbers, right? And see what we see. They had eight fact-checking organizations and, uh, or 10, and, and two of them have, I don't know, 13,000, 17,000, but everybody else has just, just a few hundred, no? And the total is 33,000. Of course, there's more than that. This is, these numbers are about two, one or two years old and, and there are more fact-checking organizations, but things are not dramatically different. So there are probably a few hundred thousand claims that have been fact-checked, right? And uh, obviously fact-checking is very important. The question is what can we do to help um, if we believe that fact-checking is the way to go, what can we do to, to help fact-checkers, okay? Well, we can do two things. And uh, this is something parallel to machine translation technology, okay? In machine translation, there are two kinds of things that you can do. One is fully automatic translation, something that Google does, right? Google Translate. And the other thing is um, tools to make professional human translators more productive. Things like Trados, those are called translation memories that make them about twice uh, faster and also higher quality, you know? Things that actually are going to help them. And it's the same thing with fact checking. You can actually build tools that are helping the fact checkers, making them more productive. And you can also have make tools that actually automate the entire process. And I, the vast majority of research is focusing on automating the entire process. Just like in machine translation, the vast majority of research is here. But I also want to mention a little bit about how we can actually help the fact checkers first. No? And um, in addition to the same tasks task that, 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 that Kevin mentioned, uh, I have been also involved in organization of, of uh, the Check That to App at CLEF. By the way, it's ongoing and we have a cool shared tasks there. If you want to join, you can. Um, and actually we have like cool shared tasks there for Spanish because we're working together with Neutral. Uh, which is a fact checking organization in Spain. Uh, actually, last year we had a round table um, at CLEF um, where we had uh, Neutral, we had Full Fact uh, uh, from UK, and we have like uh, Fatabiano, which is the leading fact checking organization in Jordan and in the Arab world. And we have been uh, um, discussing, right, what fact checkers want, what how technology can help them. And um, so, um, and I borrowed this slide from, from David Corney from Full Fact. This, this is what they want. The first thing is check worthiness, okay? There are so many claims that are being made, okay? Uh, in maybe in social media, maybe in mainstream media and so on and so forth, even in one political debate, right? What should we prioritize for fact-checking? And the second thing is fact-checking takes time. It can take a day, maybe a week, sometimes even longer than that. So uh, you really don't want to fact-check something that somebody else whom you trust has fact-checked it, no? So uh, detecting previously fact-checked claims is important. Uh, it, it's important for, for, for other reasons as well that I'm going to show you in a bit. But, um, and, and, and of course, some tools that are going to give them evidence that is going to help them make a decision. Maybe something fully automatic as well to give them an idea about whether this, the system believes is true or not. Um, and uh, uh, by the way, we have, uh, uh, I need to update this slide. 
uh, we have uh, a paper in archive, actually it has been just accepted each KI as a survey paper, uh, where we have been uh, done a survey on the um, technology to help uh, human fact checkers, okay? And, and you can go and you can, you can check it out. Um, and uh, we had the, the check that to up at, at CLEF, which has been winning for four years. And uh, you can actually still go and register because it, uh, the registration closes on April 30th and uh, the system submissions are due on May 7th. Um, and uh, we have tasks like check worthiness. So if I give you a claim uh, coming from a tweet or from a political debate to tell me whether it's interesting for fact checking or not. Um, and we offer this in Arabic, English, Spanish, Bulgarian, and Turkish. Let me update this slide. And, and uh, we also have uh, detecting whether a claim was previously fact checked. So kind of you get, for example, a tweet and, and you need to check whether um, this tweet contains a claim that has been previously fact checked and, and kind of point to this previously fact checked claim. We have this offered in Arabic and in English. And we also have the classical uh, fake news uh, detection. Uh, where you give an article and you need to say whether it's uh, fake news or not, which you all offer only in English. So, but the, the nice thing is that we have been, um, we are very proud in this uh, check that WAP, that we have been looking into those uh, uh, tasks, the check worthiness and uh, pre detecting previously fact check claims, which are also, if you think about it, they are probably important steps in a system because this is what you do. You kind of monitor, uh, uh, scan, uh, you know, maybe social media or maybe mainstream media for interesting claims, then you check whether they were previously fact-checked, and you proceed to fact-checking only if they were not previously fact-checked, right? Those are important components, but those are super important for professional fact-checkers. Um, and we have, we have been working on this. We have, we have a demo that is uh, running online that works in English and in Arabic, where you can like paste something and it's going to tell you how interesting is uh, each sentence there. This is uh, for political debates, for example. Um, and, and we can even kind of mimic the decision processes of different fact-checking organizations. You can say, okay, tell me how check worthy uh, you know, each sentence is going to be according to PolitiFact or some other organization. Um, and, and detecting previously fact check claims is something that, that uh, is potentially uh, fact check of interesting for um, journalists. Uh, and and, and uh, for example, imagine a political debate and uh, people are uh, asking, uh, kind of telling many things. And if you have something that tells you in real time whether something was previously fact checked or not, this is something that can be greatly helpful for the uh, moderator of the debate because that person can put the politicians on the spot in real time. After that, it's too late, right? And, and you can also do this uh, during, uh, um, uh, you know, a political uh, an interview, right? If you can, if you have a system that kind of can then detect, oh, he just said something that we know is false. You cannot do this with fully automatic system because it lacks the credibility. You cannot say, Mr. President, my AI tells me that you are ninety five percent likely to lie. I mean, that doesn't make sense, but. Yeah, um, and, and, and people actually do repeat themselves, right? I mean, and they do it on, on, on purpose, actually. I mean, it's, it's human nature on the one hand that uh, if you know somebody for a while, you know that they are telling the same jokes, that they, they are telling the same stories, that they have the same ideas. Um, but on the other hand, um, they are doing it on purpose because they are uh, trying to manipulate us also psychologically. They are kind of appealing to familiarity bias. The more you repeat something, the more familiar it becomes. By the way, even if I, if I kind of say, uh, it's not true that X and I keep repeating this, actually people start also believing X, okay? They're starting believing that it's not true, but they kind of also start believing it's true because it's again kind of, you know, the same familiarity bias. So this also has implications if you spot some false claim in, in uh, uh, social media, uh, you know, if you just start uh, retweeting and saying, oh, this is not true, well, you're actually helping the spread of the, of the claim as well. So you have to be careful. Um, and well, um, we have seen that the, there has not been that much manually fact-checked, right? Just like, and the capacity of, of uh, uh, fact-checking organizations is probably a few hundred uh, claims per year. Right, um, and that's not that much. Uh, so uh, we might want to have fully automatic fact checking, right? And this is something that 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 uh, uh, it's kind of scalable and it can help you uh, detect things also in real time and so on and so forth. And uh, 
um, so and, and when you if you want to do this you can do different things you can so for example here's one system it's it's our system it's called funk where it, it has uh, uh, um, puts together many of the components that you typically find in such a system so for example okay there's a claim how this claim evolves over time uh, also how people talk about it you know do they agree or disagree with the claim and then who are those people how are they connected to each other right and 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 uh, um, also um, if this claim is also published in in some on some website you know in some article is this a trustworthy website or not and maybe we know for some of the websites we don't know about others uh, how are they connected which site kind of you know is connected to which one and so on and so forth and you can kind of put all this information together and you can try to do inference on this uh, heterogeneous graph right and and that that's a paper from last year from SIC and it got the best uh, paper award. So uh, yeah, I mean, automatic fact checking is is uh, obviously also important uh, because the human fact checking uh, doesn't really scale. But still, let me ask another question. I keep asking question: Is can we fact check every single claim in the world? Okay, and um, if you think about it, um, there has been. Um, um, this this uh, uh, very famous article from Science two years ago that was saying that uh, fake news travels in, in social media, in particular in Twitter, six times faster than real ones and goes much further and so on and so forth. And it's a very famous uh, study. Um, but the, I found another article that I find much more interesting actually. Uh, and it's not that famous, but I find it really, really interesting. It shows that 50% of the lifetime spread of some very viral fake news uh, happens in the first 10 minutes. Okay, this means that if something is going to reach eventually, I don't know, 100 million people, the first 50 million are going to be reached in the first 10 minutes. Now, if you want to have a system like this, it probably takes more than 10 minutes to have mainstream kind of websites and other media write about this fake fake news it, it, and, and kind of there's probably not that much reactions to it in the first 10 minutes so you really don't have that much information to run a system like that right and the question is what can you do if you really want to act fast well one possible solution that that, that, that i actually like to uh, and that i've been advocating for is to look at the source right kind of looking into uh where is it coming from and this is what journalists do uh, is it coming from two or three uh, trusted sources or, or is it kind of mostly from sources of, uh, you know, questionable reputation, right? Uh, and it's something that you can do very fast because you can have a list of, of such websites, kind of, you can like go and, and, and or, or users and, and you can just like have, have a list and, and uh, when something new comes, you, you go and you say, okay, I know, I know this website. And the, the good thing is that if you go at this level of granularity, you can catch a lot of things. Because look, if I just want to post something in social media, I probably also want to have a link to an article, right? And where I elaborate on what, what was, has been going on. And I probably don't create a new fake news website for every false claim that I'm making. No, I'm going to reuse them. Which means that we can actually notice this and you can go and you can see what are the popular ones and you can profile them in advance. And humans are doing this manually, right? So for example, Media Bias Fact Check uh, has fact checked about 3000 uh, websites manually. But you can go and you can like do this automatically for hundreds of thousands, for millions. Okay. Um, and I like to say that if you do this, you can detect the fake news before it was even written. Because the moment when it's written and the moment when you put it uh, online and you put a link to a website, well, chances are that you actually have this website uh, in our list. Um, and uh, uh, yeah. Sorry, uh, we have to wait a minute. Okay. Uh, okay, I do. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, yes. Yeah. Okay, it's okay. So we were to mute uh, uh, person and I unmute you. Sorry. Person. Okay, no, don't, don't worry. Okay. okay. Go ahead. Okay. So, um, Okay, we continue. So let me ask another question, right? I mean, I have like going on with questions. So I'm first going to ask questions and then I'm going to show you some systems and, 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 and some, some, some practical solutions, right? Um, 
one other big question is, can we win the war on fake news? Okay. Is it, or is it something that, that, that I mean, a battle that we kind of have, have lost, right? Um, well, um, two years ago, um, I was uh, participating, I was invited together with two other experts uh, by the Interparliamentary Assembly. And for three hours, we have been questioned by members of parliament from different countries. Um, and they have been asking us what kind of legislation we can pass in the parliament so that we solve the problem of fake news once and for all. And of course, we told them certain kind of legislation is definitely useful. So for example, in many countries, certain kind of hate speech is, is illegal. And there are kind of rules in many countries that apply to political advertisements uh, at election times and so on and so forth. But of course, it's a complex problem. It needs um, uh, different partners to collaborate, right? I mean, there's, there's also definitely you need the cooperations with the social media companies and tech companies because this is, they, they own the platforms. They can do very quick interventions. Uh, and journalists and fact checkers, they are doing a lot of things also to raise awareness about the problem. We as researchers, we can build tools and so on and so forth. Um, but still the big question uh, remains, can we win the war? And the good news is that uh, the answer to this is yes. And how do you know this? Well, because they are our examples of countries that actually have won the war. This was from May, 2019, which is about two years ago. Finland has declared that it has won the war on fake news, okay? Uh, and how they did it? Well, it took them five years. They started sometimes in 2014, I believe, uh, a massive media literacy and did critical thinking campaign uh, in uh, um, focusing really on all parts of their population, starting with uh, uh, kind of focusing primarily in the schools, but really at, 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 at all levels, right? So uh, they are like teaching people that uh, if something makes you very angry, you know, I mean, you need to, to check if this kind of an image that looks strange, maybe you can do reverse image search and so on and so forth, that you should not believe everything that you see in social media uh, and so on and so forth, right? And uh, yeah, so. That's, that's the good news, right? And uh, so here's a map from two years ago. By the way, there is a new study that was done. This is about media literacy in Europe. And uh, you can see Finland, right? That has won its war. It's number one in Europe, uh, uh, in the European Union in terms of media literacy. So uh, Spain, Spain is, you know, quite high as well. You also can tell from the color, you know, the region that I come originally from Bulgaria, right here in the Balkans. It's not, you know, it's not uh, uh, so so good. Kind of the more the east and south you go, you know, it kind of starts getting uh, worse. Um, and uh, there's there's a new map, by the way. Okay, there's a new study with new results, but I could not find a new map. So a month ago there was a new study. I I, I want to see to look into the updated numbers. Um, and, and kind of, okay, so about winning the war, no? I like also to say that um, fake news is like spam. Um, and um, uh, spam, we have somehow won the war on spam. It's not that it does not exist anymore. It's still there, but it's not the kind of big problem that it was 20 years ago, no? And I hope to see fake news the same way, kind of not really eliminated, it's still going to be around, but kind of becoming largely irrelevant, just like spam today is, okay? And with motivation like this, we started the Tambi uh, mega project in the Qatar Computing Research Institute. Uh, um, uh, and our goal is to limit the impact of disinformation, propaganda, and media bias by kind of showing to the users what they're reading. And uh, the ultimate goal is to promote media literacy and critical thinking. Um, and uh, we put this into a news aggregator. So maybe in the discussion time, I can show you some, some, some systems, some demos. So it's something like Google News, but it gives you an idea about what you're reading. And we are re building rich, rich media profiles so that uh, you can get an idea about a specific source, whether it's trustworthy or not, whether it's biased in general or on specific topics like climate change or gun control or immigration and so on. Um, and uh, um, uh, we have uh, tools for fine grain propaganda analysis, which is great for promoting media literacy. We are building tools to support journalists like check worthiness, was it fact checked before? And we have those things exposed as APIs. We have browser plugins, we have Twitter bots and so on and so forth. Uh, and of course, it's a lot of work by many people from, from different groups in the Qatar Computing Research Institute. We had a big collaboration with MIT and we had joint postdocs there. 
um, and they have been working with many students from Sofia University. Um, and we have been working with uh, different partners, so um, um, uh, very closely with MIT, uh, but also with Al Jazeera. We had uh, projects with RT, uh, um, uh, Social Press. I mean, these days we're working uh, also with Facebook, with the United Nations, and, and, and with, with many others. We're also working with Neutral, uh, which is the leading fact-checking organization in Spain on the organization of the shared task and so on and so forth. Um, yeah, we have been part of some projects. Let me show you now some, some uh, research part, right? So how we can profile media, okay? And uh, we are profiling media for their factuality and, and, and bias, right? So, and this is kind of a new definition of the problem. Uh, not really checking whether a claim is true or not, and not really checking whether an article is fake news or not, but kind of trying to reason about an entire website. And once we reformulate the problem in this way, once we can actually say, I can detect the fake news before it was even written because I can go and quickly check whether I can trust this website. And it's also kind of important if I want to do fact checking, well, if I find that a bad website supports a claim, that's a bad signal. If a good website supports a claim, it's a good signal and so on and so forth. So this is something that is very useful. Um, and the nice thing is that once we redefine the problem in this way, you can now use a lot of new information sources. And we organize those around three questions. One is what was written, okay? What the, let's say this website, this newspaper has written, okay? It's primarily the articles, but also how they self-represent in social media, like what they write in their Twitter profile, in their YouTube videos. We are analyzing also the speech signal, uh, which is kind of not only what is being said, but how is it being said? Is there a lot of emotions and stuff like that? Right, and and um, also we are studying the audience who reads it, um, and and uh, in in Twitter, in YouTube, and so on, and also what is written about it in in Wikipedia, right? And I, I'm going to give you some very high high level idea about how we put those things together. Obviously, what they write is important. It's important to look into uh, maybe for subjectivity, for sentiment, for appeal to emotions. Other things are, is there a connection between the title and the body? Because when you put in social media, you know, maybe there's not uh, kind of, you can have clickbait. Um, also, how long is it? How complex is it? Because it's not easy to write fake news, no? You have to make things up. You just have one claim and now you read and need to write an entire story, story about this false claim. Well, you're probably going to write something short because in social media, you're going to have the first one or two lines anyway, and the rest is not there, or you're going to be repetitive and so on and so forth. And you can detect all this automatically, of course. And what is there about them in Wikipedia? So for example, here about this news outlet, it says it's conservative, which tells us something about his bias. I mean, doesn't really tell us, there's nothing wrong with being conservative, uh, you know, um, uh, it doesn't mean that you are fake news or anything, uh, uh, but of course there's a, connection between factuality and bias. If you are very, very biased, then you know you are probably kind of less factual. But uh, we are kind of trying to predict both factuality and bias for the media profiling. And also how you self-represent in, in social media, right? And, and is there a Twitter account um, and so on and so forth. And, and uh, so um, the structure of the URL, for example, here we have like 100% fedep.com. Uh, uh, that's not a serious or angrypatriotmovement.com or abcnews.com.co. Those are kind of fishy uh, things, right? And, and we are looking into the YouTube channels, as I said. We are looking into, let's say, I don't know, if you have, a, a, let's say, the website of CNN or let's say of, of, of Fox News or whatever, you would go there and you analyze their videos and you would look into not only what they say, but how they say it because a lot of emotions can be actually detected in the speech signal. Uh, we are also looking into the uh, Facebook audience of the medium. Uh, so for example, you can go and you can use the Facebook uh, advertisement API and you can say, uh, I want to put an advertisement to very liberal uh, viewers of Fox News. And Facebook is going to tell you, well, if you want very liberal Fox News users, there are 260,000 of those. And if I say, okay, what about very conservative? It's going to tell me 2.3 million, right? About 10 times as many. So you can actually, this is something that, that is exposed via the advertisement API to anybody, right? And if you can go there as an advertisement, it does this kind of information and we are using it. Um, and we're also analyzing Twitter. We are looking into um, 
um, kind of um, trying to profile media with respect to specific topics. Um, so, and the way that we do this is we go and we say, okay, here's a debate, let's say a hot topic, let's say COVID-19 or immigration or something like that. And let's go and see uh, uh, who are the most uh, kind of active users on this side, on that side of the debate. And let's see which media they are going to cite in support of their arguments, right? And then try from there to infer something about the media. And uh, yeah, and that's kind of nice because you can tell kind of uh, the bias of media uh, in, with respect to specific topics, but also we can also come up with, with a general bias, right? If I know what is your bias on those topics, I can tell you also where your left or right bias. Um, and uh, <clears throat> so to evaluate this, of course, uh, trust has to come from somewhere. We are using data from Media Bias Fact Check, which is a website that has uh, profiled about uh, 3,000 media. They are doing a great job for their factuality and for their bias. Um, and for, for our news outlets, let's say New York Times, they're going to tell you it's high factuality and then center left in terms of bias. And uh, <clears throat> so we have created a data set based on this, uh, with this distribution for factuality and bias. And uh, if you look first for bias, which is kind of political ideology, left, center, right, um, um, you can get about 81% F1 score if you look into what, what they have published, right? And, and uh, everything else is also helpful because see the baseline is about 19, right? Uh, but kind of what they publish, of course, is the most important thing. Uh, Wikipedia is also important, you know, Twitter, YouTube is important, followers, Facebook, and so on. Uh, and if you, if you put everything together, you gain some extra uh, points, you know, compared to just using the articles that they uh, publish. And, and uh, uh, so uh, for factuality, we have about the same baseline that is similar, about 23. Uh, uh, but how, now we don't have 81, we have 61 because it's, it's a harder task. Uh, it's also a different uh, data distribution. So, um, but again, what is most important is what they publish. Right and and uh, uh, but uh, other sources of information are also important. They are all bit with the baseline, and when you put them together, you kind of get certain uh, kind of gain. Um, and I was telling you that there is a connection between factuality and bias. There is this mediabiaschart.com, which is uh, kind of quite famous. And the higher you are, the more trustworthy you are, and the more uh, kind of lower you are, the less trustworthy you are. And here's the extreme left media, here are the extreme right media. And you probably recognize some of them. And here on the top are Reuters, you know, Associated Press, France Press, and so on. Those are the least biased ones, right? And they're kind of the most factual ones. Um, and uh, so obviously given this connection between factuality and bias, it makes sense to try to predict those two together. And another thing, if you, if you think about it, um, those are probably defined on an ordinal scale in the sense that if I say that a high factuality website, if I say they are mixed factuality, that's not such a big mistake compared to say that they are low factuality, right? So maybe I want to, to, to kind of uh, make these predictions on an ordinal scale, both for factuality and for bias. And I want to do it uh, jointly. So kind of you want to do a multi-task ordinal regression and I can introduce another help tasks like predicting the bias on a seven point scale, five point scale, three point scale, uh, uh, also predicting centrality and hyperpartisanship. And uh, if I do this, of course, I kind of, uh, uh, it helps me. Here the evaluation measure is mean absolute error because we have uh, ordinal regression and lower is better. Um, and you see that if I model bias and centrality and extremism, in addition to factuality, I kind of have, get better results for factuality, lower error. Um, and, and kind of, um, we have been also looking into bias at the article level, you might want to do to have that. One danger here is that, uh, I mean, a lot of research, both on bias detection, but also in propaganda, also in, in fake news and all that, uses distance supervision saying, okay, every single article that comes from a bad website, you know, fake news website has to be fake news, or every single article that comes from our left website has to be left. And that's not true, okay? So, um, I mean, that's, you know, true in many cases, but it's not always true. And there is this website, allsize.com, which I really like, because it shows things in triples. So you have things like um, gives you an article from the center, from the right and from the left. 
and and uh, um, you know we have developed models that are really trying to predict the bias of the article, not trying to predict the, the source of the article. Okay. And, uh, you know, for this, I mean, you have adversarial training, trying kind of, you know, to make it as confused about the source as possible, but also kind of smart triplet was that says, you know what, a left leaning scene and article should be uh, more similar to a left leaning Fox News article. And actually there are fo left leaning Fox News articles in this collection. Right, and then, and you should be further away from a right-leaning CNN article, okay? And they are actually right-leaning CNN articles uh, in this collection. Um, so let me kind of now go a little bit in the direction of propaganda. If you remember, uh, the, um, uh, initially I told you about um, um, disinformation, which is something that is both fake and means harm. And most of the work uh, is focusing on whether something is true or not. And we have been also looking into whether something is biased or not. But, um, you know, there has not been so much work on, on the trying to detect the malicious intent. And uh, for this reason, we have been looking into propaganda. Now, propaganda, what is propaganda? Well, propaganda has a definition that, that kind of means that somebody has to convince you of something and, and uh, uh, you know, they have a specific goal in, in mind. But if you pay attention, propaganda is not true, it's not false, it's not good, it's not bad. That's not part of the, of the reason. But it's a tool that is being used to uh, convince people of something. And um, again, a lot of research has been looking into is this uh, article propaganda or not? And uh, there is not much, there's actually no annotation at that level. There's annotation at the level of specific websites. Oh, this website is propaganda, this one is not. Uh, and then kind of people are using distance supervision saying, okay, all articles from this propaganda website are propaganda, all that from this non-propaganda website are not propaganda. And we have also done work like that. But uh, we started looking into explainability, kind of trying to understand how propaganda is being conveyed. And the way that this is being done is by using specific propaganda techniques. Things like uh, name calling, right? Here you have the evil has won it, or slogans, make America red again, or something like that. Um, and, and appeal to, to fear. So for example, here Greta Thunberg is says, you know, that you know, 200 species are getting extinct every day. Again, I'm not saying that she's doing something bad. As I said, propaganda is not good, it's not bad. It's not true, it's not false, okay? This is not part of the definition. It's just like that somebody is trying to convince us of something, right? To uh, uh, influence our, our opinion with specific goal. And, and uh, I mean, propaganda can be good. For example, you can have a, a government can, can engage in propaganda to um, convince its population to get vaccinated, for example. And uh, they can again kind of try to scare you, appeal to fear. If you don't do it, this is what's going to happen. Um, and what we did is we um, looked into the literature and uh, came up with a list of propaganda techniques that we liked and about half of them are certain kind of emotional manipulation. Uh, and the other half are logical fallacies, things that don't make sense uh, logically, like black and white. You're either with us or against us. Well, there are other options. Maybe I don't care. Right? And we have a data set for this with 350,000 tokens, which is good because for related tasks like name entity recognition, we have about 200,000. Um, yeah, and we have certain kind of model that tries to jointly predict whether a specific um, token is uh, one of those uh, propaganda techniques or, and also kind of whether the, the sentence is propagandistic or not. And we have some gates and so on on top of BERT. Um, so let me kind of, kind of show you the, the system in, in uh, action, right? So here are the techniques, the 18 techniques that we have. And it takes text and it highlights for you things. So for example, you pursue any aggressor. Uh, here we have appeal to fear, or we have like uh, latest outrageous attempts. This is a uh, uh, worded language. That's kind of appeal to emotions. Brutality and bloodshed is another appeal to emotions. Here we have the Congress will do our job to uphold the Constitution, defend our national security, and protect the American people. So here we have flag waving, which is appealed to patriotic feelings. Okay, that's another way kind of to convince you that something is, is the right thing to do. Um, 
and this this is something we had a shared task on this and uh, we also had a demo which was runner up for best demo award last year yes we had a shared task around these things um and it was also kind of runner up for a best task paper award at uh, seminar last year and uh, we have developed this so we have actually uh, uh we had we had a, a task uh, um, on on looking into now into memes and to, into propaganda in memes, okay, and uh, this time looking into the combination of images and text, kind of looking into those techniques, but extended not only to text but also to images. So, for example, if you look into just the text here, I hate Trump. Most terrorists do. Uh, you have here the loaded language, hate, and you have name calling. Somebody's being called a terrorist, but without the image, you cannot tell more. But with the image, you can see other things. You have smears that there is a personal attack, character assassination against one politician in Hanumar. And then there's reductio ad Hitlerum. Reductio ad Hitlerum is like um, the logical fallacies that says that if a bad person does something, this thing that the bad person does is a bad thing. So here, for example, the idea is that, okay, bad people, terrorists, you know, hate Trump. Therefore, hating Trump is a bad thing to do because bad people are, are doing that, right? It's similar to, oh, we are vegetarian. You know who else is vegetarian? You know, certain bad person, okay? And then, of course, it doesn't make any logical sense, right? But, but you know, it is a technique. Um, and it can be kind of looking into how the image together with the text, you know, uh, combine to uh, uh, manipulate us. And this is, again, great for, for explainability, right? Because we can explain to people why, uh, how they are being manipulated. And of course, those are, uh, there, are there are many, many more interesting uh, uh, examples. Um, and uh, <clears throat> so I'm uh, about to finish. Let me just tell you a little bit about the COVID-19 infodemic, right? Um, <clears throat> so early on last year, back in February, the World Health Organization was saying, we are not just fighting a new pandemic, we are fighting an infodemic, okay? And, and uh, uh, they even had, this is a snapshot that they took uh, last February, uh, the World Health Organization in their website, they had a list of top five things as a priority in this order in fighting the pandemic, okay? And number two was actually fighting the infodemic, okay? Which means that they really recognized early on how important it is. And, and, and it's very important to these days, right? There's so much disinformation about this. Um, and now again, look, February 12th last year, there was this article in MIT Technology Review that was talking about that the coronavirus brought us the first true social media infodemic. Uh, that's interesting. But another interesting thing that I noticed was that, look, they are not just talking about whether it's true or not. They're talking about panic. They're talking about racism. So they're kind of talking about certain other aspects of the problem. Um, and this is something that motivated us to try to look into the problem from different perspectives and, and trying to say, okay, can we look into this problem from, uh, can, we, can we develop an, an analysis schema that takes the perspective of journalists, of fact checkers, of social media platforms, policy, make, policy makers, and, and maybe society as a whole. Um, and we have like a nice schema over five layers and so on and so forth. I don't want to go much into detail. I'm just going to show you some examples, right? Some aspects that we are looking into. Of course, you have the rumors. You have the panic. Oh, a zombie apocalypse is coming. Americans are buying guns and stuff. You have jokes that are innocent. You have xenophobic, racist things, things like don't eat Chinese food, don't eat Italian food. Um, you have promotion of bad cures, like, uh, oh, both garlic water is going to cure uh, COVID. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, this blaming of the authorities, but there are also kind of positive things, things like advice uh, or interesting questions being asked and so on and so forth. And uh, we organized this around five questions, right? And the first five are around focusing on check worthiness. Is this an interesting claim to fact check, right? So, and the first uh, thing is, okay, does it even contain a verifiable factual claim? Okay, this is about tweets. Um, and then is it likely to be false? Is it of interest to the general public? Is it harmful? And then based on this, you should kind of decide whether this is interesting for <clears throat> uh, to be fact-checked. And, and then is it, and, and those questions six and seven are more like explanations. Why is it harmful? Or maybe because it promotes uh, panic or it promotes fake cures or you know, ra racist or xenophobic uh, 
uh, things and so on and so forth. And uh, yeah, we have different experiments on this in English and Arabic, and we have uh, sizable improvements over the baseline um, and uh, cross language and also kind of modeling the context and whether something is a bot and propaganda. One thing that I want to point to you is that um, if you try to detect check worthiness for a specific claim, if you try just like to predict directly whether something is check worthy or not, as opposed to doing multitask learning of whether it's likely to be false, it's likely to be of general interest and likely to be harmful. Together, it's whether it's likely to be uh, check worthy. Actually, we have a huge improvement in terms of accuracy and way to take one, right? So it's really interesting, <clears throat> even if you're interested in just like the check worthiness to, to look into other, other things. Um, and here we had some demos on this. Uh, it's kind of integrated in certain websites like InfoTagent. Um, and I'm finishing just before that to tell you that we have been also developing tools for journalists. Uh, we had this project uh, um, um, in 2019 with Al Jazeera, RTR, one Associated Press and some other partners. Uh, and we got some award on this where we have been developing a system where, uh, which was for self-monitoring. Those media organizations want to uh, self-check the quality of their content, whether they are biased, whether they are, check, they are trustworthy and so on and so forth. So for example, you upload a video and tells you whether uh, it's biased and whether it contains claims that have been previously fact-checked and whether those are true or false claims. And it's about bias. And we have all these things exposed as APIs, which allows kind of, you know, to build those also external partners to build uh, apps on top. So for example, if I give you an article, it's going to tell whether it's propagandistic, or if you give an article, it's going to tell you whether it's uh, uh, those, the spans of propaganda techniques and the type of technique, the bias center left, right at the article level, check worthiness. If you give an article, it's going to tell what are the most interesting claims, sentences there to fact check, comparison to previously fact check claims, uh, and all kinds of things related to COVID-19 to this uh, nice scheme. It's all exposed there as APIs. Um, and I'm finishing here and with, with kind of uh, uh, an observation that, uh, uh, well, there's this uh, view, very popular view that alternative facts that, you know, some people start talking about, oh, it's not wise, it's, it's alternative facts. Okay, that, that actually, okay, those are actually wise. Um, and that's a, you know, a valid viewpoint, but you should also kind of pay attention that uh, what is true and what we perceive as true is really kind of a reflection of reality and we might have a limited view point. And uh, I stop here so that there's some time for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Presla, for your impressive, I have to say impressive uh, presentation about your last uh, works on on fake news, disinformation, and the last uh, insights uh, about how to treat the, the information with uh, COVID. So, as you said, it's time for questions. It's time for discussion. So feel free. Um, I think we have the first question uh, in the chat. Okay, first, uh, before starting to the question, okay, if uh, any of you want to make a question, okay, please, uh, write uh, okay say something in the chat uh, or write your question in the chat okay so i don't know who is uh, ipec so ipec yes uh, so um no. i really agree about uh, detecting in source level is very useful to for early detection of fake news uh, however, uh, in social media, we see that some of uh, posts, uh, they have a picture uh, and uh, like a screenshot of a Twitter post and uh, they, um, in these uh, images, they contain some claims. In this case, uh, the uh, source of uh, this uh, screenshot post uh, could be manipulated by yeah, malicious people. Like maybe they replace uh, the uh, Twitter account or uh, news media account by using some image manipulation techniques. Uh, 
so in this case, I would like to know your uh, thoughts about determining truthfulness of such claims. Yeah, I mean, this is a great, uh, great question, right? So I was talking to somebody at some point uh, um, about fake news, you know, and, and, and I got a very similar kind of observation. They are telling me, look, in our country, okay, uh, whatever country it was, um, most of the disinformation comes in uh, on, on mobile phones, uh, let's say WhatsApp or something like that, no? And the vast majority of those are actually snapshots. Okay, because people kind of set, set snapshots. And sometimes this is real information, you know, that kind of they just uh, take a snapshot from some website and just share that. And so in some cases, it's actually something manipulated, right? So, my personal experience in my, I have been also getting messages like this. My personal experience is that um, when there are things like, oh, here the new government measures on something, or here the new fines for traffic violations, or he is this or he is that, right? And, and kind of this, this some certain kind of snapshot uh, has been that every single time that somebody was sending around a snapshot, this was not true, okay? I mean, the question is why should they send a snapshot? Why don't you, don't you kind of send a link to the official information, right? To the original information. Of course, in some cases, it came that it's just like easier, but, but, but again, you know, so I mean, the, my first reaction is, if it's an image, as opposed to something else, I mean, unless there's kind of some real reason, uh, you know, that's 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 something fishy. Of course, kind of in Twitter, uh, you might want the snapshot because it's an image; it get kind of gets gets more engagement. So, uh, yeah. Uh, still, obviously, you can do OCR. You can try to extract the text from the image and you can just do uh, the, the standard fact checking, right? You can see uh, the standard things, whether uh, legitimate websites agree or disagree or trusted users agree or disagree with this claim and do the normal things. And uh, extracting text from each image is kind of easy. We have done it on memes. It really works very well. Um, I think the Google Vision API, you know, is, is doing a great job at that. Um, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> but, here we are going into the problem of checking one specific claim. And I was kind of more talking about uh, focusing on the source. So one answer is, well, the first thing I'll do is like I'll check whether can I trust this user or not, right? So, and, and, and sorry, and, and the, other thing, the other thing kind of that you can do uh, uh, for, for early detection is actually to, to check uh, whether these, their propagandistic techniques being used because I can say something that is false, but it's just not going to work if I can, if it doesn't get make you angry, is it doesn't kind of get you emotional, and it's not going to be shared, right? You have to use those propaganda techniques, so we can also kind of look into those. So there's another question by Alberto Argente. Uh, yes, we have another question. Okay, so Alberto, do you want to speak or? Yes, yes, I can, I can speak. Uh, well, the question is that. Uh, can be the echo chamber mitigated by these systems that reduce the spread of, of fake news or propagandistic news or uh, the properties of this type of groups that, uh, well, they, can, they don't accept the opinion of uh, the other people will, may, will uh, I don't know how to say it. I don't know if you are understanding me. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I, I think I got it. Let, let me kind of try to paraphrase that, right? So um, <clears throat> the question is, okay, so I, I, I guess that, that one concern is that, uh, well, I mean, if, if people have their certain beliefs because they, we all live in those filtering bubbles and all these echo chambers that kind of we have friends and we are connected, let's say, in social media to people that, that think similarly to us, and kind of you go there and kind of, you just think that, you have to have the right opinion because everybody else thinks like you, no? And this is this kind of, you know, true of, of, of and, and then you just don't even realize. They're giving like those studies that at election times in the US, the previous elections, even the previous elections, and even more so in this kind of the social media spheres, there's almost no connection between the this side and that side. They kind of live in their own worlds, right? So that, 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 that is a problem. And actually, let me, let me take this opportunity to show you something, okay? Uh, uh, very quickly. Do you guys see my screen? Yes. 
Okay, so this is the PERTA system, right? Which um, um, <clears throat> does this kind of fine grained propaganda analysis, right? And and uh, look, the way that, that 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 this can be addressed is, I mean, this is a great 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 tool in my view to promote uh, uh, media literacy and critical thinking because um, you know I can basically show you. Um, um, you know, kind of the use of specific propaganda techniques in, in the text, right? And, and uh, as I said, here, here half of them are uh, appeals to uh, emotions and half of them are logical fallacies. And after interacting a bit with a system like this, you kind of remember the, the techniques and then you probably don't need the system, okay? Because uh, you can, uh, you know, you can just, uh, you can just uh, go, go there and kind of next time you read the news, you kind of start recognizing those those techniques, and and uh, it has happened to me. So now that I read the news, because I have interacted with this system for a while, I, I just see the propaganda techniques everywhere. I, I see them in social media, right? And and I just consume the content in a little bit different way, right? Because because I recognize the techniques. Um, and now the thing is, suppose that that you like I don't know. Suppose that you like Fox News, you hate CNN. Well, we can go there and you can show you how bad CNN is. Okay, I mean bad. I mean you can just go there and you can show you, you know, uh, the propaganda techniques in the media that you don't like. Okay, and and then we don't really tell you, uh, or, or or the other way around, right? Kind of maybe, maybe you kind of don't, you know, you don't you you like Fox News. Kind of you don't like Fox News, and kind of you're going to show you. You know things there. So the point is that um, we don't need to tell you something that you don't like. We kind of can tell you things that you agree with, right? They are kind of propaganda techniques. Again, propaganda is not good; it's not bad, right? It's uh, yeah. it's a technique, right? But we can show you things that are consistent with your view and kind of try to make you think. If you kind of recognize the techniques in the media that you don't like. Next time you are going to also see them in the media that you do like, okay? And maybe kind of you are going to get the critical thing. I think that's more important. Um, this also kind of allows us to look into, to do analysis. You can also see how left media, or right media write about something. Look, for example, I don't know, let's say uh, about COVID-19, how CNN writes about it. This world, it's language, it's emotions. Uh, this fear, okay, fear is number three, okay? Slogans are down here. Uh, if you look in Fox News, fear is down here. Slogans are up here, flag waving, patriotic feelings are up here, right? So, so yeah, and you can go and you can explore this. And uh, I mean, you can also kind of do this. I mean, you can say, I don't know, you can submit your own, uh, uh, you can submit your own text for analysis, right? So, um, and, and you can also kind of put a link here and that's also available via an API. Um, okay, it's taking some time. There was another well, question. Yeah, sorry. Uh, what I, I want have, to uh, yeah. uh, with this system that can detect the propaganda techniques, we can improve the uh, performance to detect uh, propaganda well, I mean, news or propaganda facts from other new domains. I mean, when we train a new assistant, we train that system with a closed set of source news, but when new layers news appears from source news appears, the model can't detect that news correctly because the model learns how uh, a source write usually write the the news, not to the really detect that that news. No, but here I have been showing you. Your... Uh, I mean, this automatic analysis, right, of, of, of uh, uh, you know, of, of specific, I mean, it's it, it's analyzing, I mean, any text. I mean, you can go there and you can like paste any text and, uh, um, you know, it reads from, from manually annotated text. Of course, uh, I mean, I agree with you that after some time, maybe the topics are going to shift and, uh, you know, maybe the kinds of words and the kinds of things, uh, it might become outdated. You might need more training data. Um, so, and we are also kind of uh, analyzing entire news outlets. Maybe I can show you here. Take this opportunity, uh, right? 
I don't know, I can uh, take certain, let me take some good source, uh, right? And we also have like a Chrome plugin and so on, where as you're reading, I don't know, let's say I'm reading uh, CNN. Let me see if I have the plugin, I think I have it. Yes, it's going to tell me that it's left-leaning, that it's high factuality, and that kind of the framework is political, economic, and it's not very propagandistic. So let me go back to BBC, right? I mean, this is the media profile that we are building, right? So it's very central, not hyper-partisan, and uh, it's really not propagandistic. We have analyzed more than 50,000 articles, and you see that they are very unlikely to be propaganda. And here's the framing. The framing is, is how you talk about things. So for example, I don't know, let's say Brexit or COVID-19, you can talk about this from a, you know, I don't know, political viewpoint, but also from health or legal or quality of life or, or human rights and stuff like that. Um, and the factuality, that's kind of what we know about BBC. We kind of think they are very factual. And as I said here, we are looking into not only what they publish, but also social media and their videos and so on. And they are biased left, center, right. And if we have those things and uh, their audience, right? It's kind of mostly kind of center liberal. And they are kind of, you know, biased with respect to specific topics, right? Uh, yeah, and kind of we built profiles for, for, for different uh, media. I don't know. I might have some Spanish ones. Let me see. Uh, Let They are quite central. Well, actually, well, yeah, high factuality. Uh, somehow it's believe it's, it's center. I don't know. Is it center? You guys know better. Uh, it depends on where, who you ask. Yes, okay. <laughs> yes, okay. <laughs> yes. Right. So, okay. so, so Preslav, okay, El Pais, and now it's uh, most of the people think about uh, left, uh, left oriented, okay? I see. Okay. But it depends, okay. So, uh, thank you, Berto. Any more questions? I don't know if Bert, uh, Berta wants to... Ah, the bead. Berta, I don't know. Hi. Hello. Berta? Yes, uh, yes, only a, a suggestion from a psychosocial point of view, because, you know, I'm a social psychologist with a degree in journalism. Then uh, I'm very shocked because this technology I didn't know. Uh, but I think when you approach propaganda, are you approaching it from only from the point of view of, uh, I will say, American uh, mainstream literature? But there is an area of research in Europe that studies social influence from the 60s that distinguishes between majority social influence from the majority and social influence from the minority, because the minorities uh, has some techniques and some strategies to, to reach social influence. For example, you use Greta Thunberg example, and I was using it this morning with my students to explain how minorities uh, get influence using conflict, because a minority always use conflict to, to be heard. Then it's I mean, when you approach the mm -hmm. study mm -hmm. of the propaganda only from research, you know, taking into account only the words that mm -hmm. people mm -hmm. use, mm -hmm. but not taking into account the status of the source. If mm -hmm. it's, minor, it's a minority source that we define li like someone without power, you know, minority is not a numeric concept, it's a, it's a problem of power then will be interesting if you are able to introduce in some moment this perspective that not only takes into account the words that people use, but also um, the, the status of the source. Because mm -hmm. at the beginning, we only study conformity. But in the 60s, Moscovici and people from France start to study minority influence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the kind of strategies that minority use could be liable like, like propaganda in the sense that they 
has only a way to be heard, that, that is to make a big conflict in terms of rhetoric. <laughs> you, you, yes, 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 no, 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 I totally get it and I find it super interesting. Uh, yeah, may, maybe we should talk, uh, you know, because look, um, I, I, I mean, I'm wondering whether that would be, we might be able to see this at the, at the type of propaganda. I mean, the nice thing about what we are doing is that we are not just uh, black and white, this is propaganda, this is not. We are looking into the specific techniques that are being used. And I mean, based on what you are saying, I kind of, I can somehow see it, no? If you, if you have the power, then you don't probably don't need the conflict. Maybe things like glittering generalities. Oh, you know, we have this great leader, you know, and this and that, and you know, everything is great. This is the yeah, best the economy of ever, right? To kind of maybe appeal to patriotic feelings and stuff like that, you know. I mean, stay with us, stay with the country, and you know, those kind of things that you might might expect to be more prominent, and others that don't really have, and for them, the only way to be it's kind of to be hurt is to get from them and start like name calling people or appealing to fear. If you don't do this, this is gonna happen and stuff like that, right? And, and, and those kind of things, we probably can, can see it in the different distribution of the propaganda techniques. I have shown in different distribution between CNN and Fox News, and there might be similar kind of different distribution that, that is there to be seen, even in automatic analysis. Yes, yes, things. yes, that's it. I mean, maybe it's a source of confusion. When I see your, your work in October, I was a bit shocked for some results. Mm -hmm. I, I think El País is centered, uh, but <laughs> okay. I, I, I'm shocked about some uh, results uh, in last October. And I thought that maybe it's because uh, there is a need of another variable in terms of- I see. You know what I mean? Well, yes, this, yes, is yes. The, the, this was the idea. Yes. That I want to share. No, I think, I, yeah, I think what, what probably needs to be done is uh, even to, to take the propaganda techniques that we have and just take some data that comes from those sources versus those other, and even kind of manually, even manually have a look into, into this and try to see, you know, what kind of propaganda techniques are being used by uh, minorities and majorities. Exactly. It's completely and, you know, different. Yes, yes. Right. Yeah. That's it. Thank you. That's, that's very useful. Thank you. Okay. No, Eugenio, switch on your micro. Okay. Uh, it's not working, your micro, Eugenio. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay, man, the micro. Uh, David? Okay, um, thank you. Uh, uh, Nice to meet you, Preslav. Very nice, uh, very nice uh, presentation. Okay, it's uh, I'm, I'm uh, David Camacho from Technical University of Madrid. Uh, so we are currently working. Uh, uh, maybe you, you don't know, but we are currently in uh, here in Madrid uh, on elections. So we are trying to analyze the different uh, uh, political political parties here, and and we. We are trying to, to work on fake news detection, and we have found two different problems. One is related with multilingual, mm -hmm. the multilingual problem, because I think you saw, you saw one example that combines in your presentation Arab with English. And you know, it's not the same to use deep learning models that has been trained in English than in other language. Okay. More or less, we are more interested currently in analyzed uh, Spanish, especially mm -hmm. Spanish language. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, we are finding some problems to use uh, pre-trained English architectures or pre-trained architectures models from the planet. So my question is, what do you think about this, the multilingual problem, how, how it could be combined? And if, a second question, if you think that this, it can be used, uh, the transfer learning, to take like a pre-trained English model and to use more or less directly using uh, in Spanish, for instance. Uh, what is uh, what about your your experience about this kind of combination between two different languages? Okay, so um, I think that that uh, um, okay. So so uh, the frankly the the example of El País was risky uh, because. Um, 
I can tell what happens. Kind of my our observation is that uh, I, I kind of I kind of typically don't don't show those things. I mean, is that is that exactly transfer learning kind of you know cross language and all that cross language representation? We have found that whether you translate or you kind of just use cross language representation, you get about the same results. And and uh, but but the the problem is this that that. It's it's really different things. If you think about it, let's say for example, whether something is left or right, okay, it's 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 really there's those are not universal notions. Even if you apply the model trained on American media to UK media, even there it starts breaking, okay? Because I don't know, let's say gun control. Gun control is not an issue in UK. It's a big issue in the US, right? And stuff like that. Even the topics that are being discussed and, and kind of, and then left and right, they are not even universal notions. So left and right don't exist in many political systems around the world. And in Eastern Europe, it's a total mess. So for example, in Bulgaria, where I come from and kind of Eastern Europe, left is partially left and partially right, okay? Because left is kind of, I mean, it's, I mean, the, it's socially conservative, but left in economic sense. So any change, Typically change on the West comes from the left, kind of the right is conservative. In Eastern Europe is the other way around. The left is occupied by the communist parties. Those are the conservative parties, right? Any change in the society comes from the right. So it's 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 kind of, you know, different. It's even, even strange to me how, you know, at the European Union level, you have the European, uh, I don't know, popular party or something. And, and it puts there, you know, people that are left, right, in, in, in kind of, you know, in traditional European sense, uh, but kind of, uh, conservative, right, in Europe, but kind of, you know, uh, you know, uh, reformative in, in Eastern Europe, kind of, you know, things that, that have different. A anyway, kind of going back to your, your thing, I expect issues, right, when to try to transfer a model, because the topics that are being discussed are different. The problems that are being discussed are different. Um, uh, uh, there, there might be le le less of a problem if you try to transfer the propaganda techniques. The propaganda techniques are probably similar, right? I mean, black and white fallacy were either with us or against us, or, uh, you know, uh, red herring, kind of introducing an argument that doesn't have anything to do, or name calling, or exaggeration. Those things, you know, probably don't, are kind of more language independent. So, press that. Okay, I yes. saw that Alejandro is uh, there, uh, Alvaro, I mean. Uh, but uh, in uh, regarding the question of David, uh, so have you worked in any in any method to make this uh, domain trans uh, or uh, transferring the domain? Okay, because as you say, okay, uh, uh, the word liberal in the United States, okay, is a more is a left side, but here in Europe, okay, uh, to say for I'm a liberal is more the right, uh, it's more of the right, okay. So have you worked in Methods of okay, as in sentiment analysis and in other NLP tasks to transfer the domain from one domain to another domain because, uh, as you said, it's a big problem. Okay, it's not the same to, to train your model, okay, uh, with news from the United States as uh, with news from the UK, and you are working with the same language, but the domain is still the, it, not the domain, okay, it's a, oh, yes, the culture domain, okay. So, how do you work to method to transferring? So, so actually, you know what? I have some slides that I rushed through that I can show you that actually have examples of that, right? So I mean, when we're talking about the COVID-19, yeah. uh, uh, I mean, um, this is something, yeah. I mean, look, uh, we, have, we have some English data, we have some Arabic data. Actually, now we have also Bulgarian and Dutch data. Um, and uh, so, I don't know. If you, have, if you train on English and you test on, sorry, if you want to test on English, you know, if you add some extra Arabic data, it actually helps you, right? And, and I mean, this is kind of more like, or if you kind of train on Arabic, you kind of add some extra English data and it actually helps you. I mean, what I'm trying to say is there's, there's some information that you can you can do. It's just not exactly the cross language thing. It's more yeah. like, do I get some something something in addition, right? From, from the other language. I mean, this kind of a bit of transfer learning, but uh, it's not completely transferring from one language to another. Mm -hmm. To be honest, to be honest, I don't see a reason to do it that way, okay? I, I'm okay. I mean, I'm, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not a big fan of uh, uh, zero-shot learning. I mean, let's say a few-shot learning is fine, right? Yeah. Uh, the, the point is, you can always have. It's always possible to annotate a little bit of examples in your language, right? So, so for example, if you have, I can have a few thousand examples in English. 
if I want to transfer this to Spanish, why should I do it in a fully language independent way? Maybe I can add a hundred examples in Spanish, right? That's something that I can sit and do in one or two days, right? And then I can yeah. have this kind of hybrid approach. That's exactly what I have shown you here. For Arabic, we had very little data, right? But uh, and we kind of added to this English, but we didn't really do purely English adapt, you know, to Arabic because, yeah, there, there are problems with the, with the shift of, of of topics that are being discussed and so on. Uh, uh, when you say that you only need to take some little bit uh, examples, how, how, how much, uh, how many examples? What about the size of these Arab uh, examples? Because we have tried in Spanish and it does not work uh, very well, to be honest. So, so, so oh. we, I mean, I have been talking about many tasks. So what, what was the task that you have tried it to? Mm -hmm. No, no, okay, kind of, it's a question. What, what task did you try to? So it might also depend on the task, right? So uh, we, we try to, to identify uh, textual entailment between the two oh, different it's... sentences. Yeah. Textual entailment is a very hard problem, right? And, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and uh, I mean, their, their natural language inference, they are super high uh, results that are being reported. But then if you kind of try to run it for, uh, let's say in um, stance detection or something like that here for, for fake news, does this, uh, you know, tweet agree with this claim or not? It doesn't, I mean, the actual numbers are, you know, not, not, not the same because uh, yeah, um, it, it is, it is hard. Okay. I mean, but the, in, in principle, right? Many of the phenomena are, are preserved across languages. So, for example, there has been this work that was showing uh, a work on sentiment analysis. Okay, this by by I think uh, Saif Muhammad and Muhammad Salame and so on. I can point you to that. Um, and they have been looking into sentiment. Okay, and and, and uh, they have been looking into okay. So, if I have some uh, uh, something in English and I translate to Arabic. Even if I do it manually or I do it automatically with an automatic machine translation system, do I preserve the sentiment there? Okay, right? Yeah. yeah. And you know what? Actually, it turns out that it is preserved. Okay. If you ask humans, the sentiment is there. However, the systems, if you run the system, it drops a lot. And the question is why? Well, one thing, and this was, of course, uh, all the work before the embeddings, right? It was kind of mostly word based systems. One thing that happens is that there is a shift in the vocabulary. So for example, suppose that your system um, has been seeing things like, um, I don't know, this is awesome. That's terrific, okay? And then, then you have translation that actually says this is great. It really means the same thing, but you have not seen the word great, okay? So, so to a human, it's clear that it says the same thing, but this is not how human, I mean, kind of, it's not exactly fluent, or it's not the exact term that humans would normally use there. But kind of the sentiment is preserved. So, um, and we have actually done uh, tra automatic translation. My personal impression is that many of those things, let's say framing, where it is about health perspective or, or I don't know, or, or uh, human rights perspective or, or political perspective when you talk about COVID-19, that's kind of preserved, right? Even in automatic translation. The propaganda techniques, many of them are going to be preserved, right? If there's name calling, there's still name calling. If there's exaggeration, there's still exaggeration, right? Uh, but mm -hmm. the problems might still break because of, of, of uh, uh, yeah, shift. That, that's why I'm saying you probably need a little bit of, of, of in-domain data, right? In, in the target yeah. language, so that, you know, the model can, can adapt. Yeah. yeah. yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Thanks. Thank you. I need to leave. Uh, Eugenia, I will use this uh, some last uh, seconds to make some propaganda. <laughs> past week, past week, uh, a press lab, past week, it was accepted uh, a special issue on infodemics. So if uh, Eugenio agrees, I will send you the special issue to, to the people that attend to this uh, seminar to invite you to, to, to send some, some paper. It's uh, in a journal, it's a first quartet journal. So it's, okay. it's, uh, I okay. think it's a good journal. Yeah. So it's a journal on infodemics. So I really enjoyed your 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 talk. Thank you very much. I, and I'm sorry, I need to leave for to uh, for, a, for a new meeting. Uh, go ahead, okay. David, uh, thanks, uh, yes. Alvaro. I think the this is maybe the last question. Uh, okay, yeah. Alvaro. Okay, go ahead.
Thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you, Presla, for your presentation. Uh, I'm working with David in, the, in Madrid, the uh, Universidad Politécnica de Madrid. And my question was about, uh, in relation with the sentiment analysis and hate, why I say that? Because one thing that we have faced up is the difficulty of predicting, not predicting, uh, being um, a new topic that can be appears in misinformation or in misleading information. How can we be prepared if we don't have seen uh, before that kind of topic or, or information? So uh, maybe hate or sentiment is very useful because I don't know, uh, it can be very general in, in text. So what is your opinion and what kind, kind of thing do you think we can do for predict new topics that can be appear? Yeah, yeah. So, so the the one big danger in general, right, with with uh, models uh, to predict whether something is fake news or not, uh, is that they can overfit, as you say, to the topic, right, and to the specific language that is being used. Oh, those guys are talking about five G, and those that guys are talking about this, right? I mean, if you, if you talk about five G and COVID nineteen in the same sentence, maybe something is fishy or something like that, right? But tomorrow the topic is something different, and then. What is your system doing? No, so um, obviously any system that is based on text has some sensitivity to the to the kind of things that is trained on. Um, on the other hand, uh, yeah. So what we are looking into is we're looking into. I mean, if you look at the fine grain propaganda techniques, the thing is this is not about whether it's true or not. Okay, and it's about the kind of language that is being used. And I can I argue again. You know, I can't speculate. Just like I was telling you, look. Uh, if you if you detect the source, you can detect the fake news before it was even written. Now I'm going kind of to make another, uh, you know, um, big claim, and the big claim is, you know, uh, um, that if you have a system to detect the use of propaganda techniques in text that works well, there is no theoretical defense against it. If you are an adversary, if you are if you are a person that wants to 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 kind of to to do the the to spread the fake news, okay? Why? Well, I'll tell you why. Because um, look, if suppose that you have a, I, I, I like to say that, that fake news is like spam on steroids, right? Uh, it's different because uh, if I sp spent a spam to 100 people, probably does, they don't share it further. If I send fake news to 100 people, maybe they send it to, to millions eventually, right? Kind of and so on and so forth. But uh, on the other hand, if I, if I build a spam filter and if you ask me how it works, I tell you, well, it looks for uppercase letters, for dollar amounts, you know, for this, for that, and or kind of for broken English and so on and so forth. You know, say, okay, big deal, I'm not going to use this, right? And then I'm going to bypass your, 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 your filter. Now, if I tell you, I'm looking for the use of propaganda techniques, it's simply not an option to stop doing this because you can lie as much as you like. If it doesn't make people angry, if it doesn't, you know, if it doesn't touch them, Right, it, it, they are not going to act based on it. They are not going to share it further. It's not going to work. Okay, so looking into the propaganda techniques, and of course the sentiment, you know, kind of the name calling, all these kind of the emotions, it's it's a very essential thing. And you know what? Again, I was talking about when I was talking about this information that it is false, but also kind of intends to do harm. The focus on the intention of the harm is very very important. Again, we are talking to journalists. They are telling me the best propaganda is when you tell the truth. Only the truth, but not the whole truth. There is also bias by selection. I can, 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 can bombard you with articles, even from good media, right? But on some specific topic, you know, to bias in a specific way. But, but here the thing is that, yeah, if you have to manipulate me, you have to do certain kind of things. So, and, and if we build systems to detect those linguistic clues there, that it's simply not an option to not to use them. Uh, you know, and, and, and those are kind of more language kind of topic independent. I mean, things like name calling, of course, I don't know, there are new words like COVID idiot, right? Or, or uh, you know, cov, cov, it's COVID idiot, right? It's kind of, you know, stuff like that, you know, I mean, okay, there, there are new ways to call somebody something with respect to new political situation, but still, I mean, many things are still remain, yes. Thank you. Thanks, Alvaro. So, Alejandro, are you there? 
Yes, thanks, Eugenio. Thanks, Nakov, uh, for your talk. I have just a question. I work at the Technical University of Madrid uh, with David, and actually, I have a, a very similar question with the one he did uh, about the language and, and about multilingual or also cross-lingual models. Uh, we have some difficult, uh, have found difficulties when training uh, uh, models and applying them. Uh, when we are uh, using, for instance, uh, the language we use in in social networks like uh, Twitter, it's not the same that, that the language we we see in a journal or the 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 language uh, we use in a, in a talk, for instance. So, do you think? My question is: Do you think uh, to approach uh, uh, this kind of problem in, in social network is just a problem of training data, or it's a higher it, it, ha it has higher complexity to, to deal with this kind of language. Um, so um, there's a bit of bot when we have evidence of bot. Um, I have shown you that we have been looking into um, detecting propaganda techniques in memes, right? And memes are something that is shared in social media and kind of the language there is similar to, I mean, we had, we had memes from coming from Facebook Right, and but kind of memes are shared also in Twitter and so on. The language there is similar to you know how how you write in general in, in social media, um, and uh, when we annotated data for this, we have about a thousand uh, you know memes annotated in this way, and we saw that that uh, the distribution of the propaganda techniques was different. Okay, so one example that I can give you uh, is that uh, repetition. Repetition, I mean, repetition, not simple repetition, but, but with a purpose. Something like, I don't know, maybe you have like four politicians there and three of them say, I promise, I promise, I promise. The third one says, I deliver, okay? And now kind of you say, you know, those guys just promise, right? Kind of here, I promise, it's not a simple repetition. It's there, has a rhetorical structure, right? I mean, and, and, and when we are doing this in newspapers, this was a marginal thing. We are even thinking of, throwing it out because we don't need it. Let's simplify the schema. Why do you need so many techniques? It's not going to happen in tweets. You know, in, in actually it was one of the most frequent ones. Okay, not most, but kind of among the frequent ones. So kind of, you know, what I'm trying to say is that the, the distribution of the techniques in social media and in mainstream, in, in kind of in the websites is different. I mean, that's, that, that's for sure. On the other hand, um, we had just had a competition on detecting those propaganda techniques in memes. And we had there about a thousand examples and we had 20,000 sentences that were trained from, you know, from, from newspapers, right? And actually the winning systems in the competition were using this additional data that comes from, from media, right? And this was giving them a huge, huge improvement over the little data that we had. So, which means that they are different, the techniques, but still kind of, you know, if you want to train a system and if you have a lot that comes from media, you know, use it as well. But again, pay attention. It's not simple transfer learning in the sense that I just take this and I apply it to a new domain. No, you also have some data in, in the target domain and, and, and then it's kind of helps. Okay, thanks. Yep. So thank you, Alejandro. So now the last question is, I'm going to close the questions uh, time. So uh, Preslav, okay, this may be the most angled question in the sense that, <laughs> Uh, so I have uh, listened to you. Uh, you speak about the stance detection, uh, fact checking. So I see something related with argumentation mining. But uh, how can you define? Okay, this fake news detection. So, so it's a mixture of argumentation mining, stance detection, uh, fact, uh, fact checking, factual, factuality. Okay, factuality. Mm -hmm. So. How can you, okay, so if you have a new student and you say, okay, before making a system of fake or about fake news, okay, to detect fake news, okay, what do you have to study first, okay? Argumentation mining, stance detection, so. Um, okay, so let me, uh, okay, so let me, share a screen for a second and remind you of one slide that I had. So this is the, the, the slide on um, 
from from a system, right? I'm kind of, I mean, there, there, there are other systems, right? Similar systems, but but I mean, this this system here, right? It kind of puts yeah. many of those things together, yeah. because uh, here, uh, what you need is you need stance detection because you need to know uh, whether users agree or disagree with this claim, right? Uh, you also need to profile entire websites to know whether you trust them or not, right? Whether this is a fake news website or not. Um, and, and uh, yeah, you, uh, yeah, and, 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 and the, whole, the whole goal here is like actually to, to do a trial to have a verdict on, on, on one specific claim. And uh, yeah, so here you really kind of have, have all these things together. Um, and of course, Many of those things, I mean, things that are missing in the picture is, uh, th there are many things missing in the picture, right? So, um, and some of those are th those that you have mentioned. I mean, and they're, they're, they're related to what is actually being said, you know, not, not what, but actually how is it being said, right? Is yeah. there kind of a lot of emotions, you know, is this related to argumentation mining and so on and so forth. Um, so you see that it's okay, that the, the task most related with, uh, this fake news or propaganda detection is argumentation mine. Okay, argumentation, stance detection, isn't it? Uh, yes, yes, and uh, but I'm also kind of I'm I'm also arguing for for the importance of our other other tasks, yeah. right? And one of them is uh, profiling entire websites, kind of source reliability estimation. Um, um, also propaganda detection kind of, but this kind of fine grained one with explainability. I think those are important. I mean, those are things that we started, right? Kind of that, that, that and, and uh, uh, that, that others have neglected. Uh, uh, two others are, one is uh, check worthiness, right? I mean, check worthiness, somebody else, uh, kind of Chen Kai Li from University of Texas in Arlington, he had this uh, claim buster system. Uh, we had claim rank and, but kind of, we start like looking more into this problem, looking also into how you define check worthiness for tweets. Right um, and and uh, you know also in political debates and so on, that that's important as well uh, uh, to be able kind of to detect the interesting claims and uh, detecting previously fact checked claims. That's a growing area, right? That, that again kind of we introduced this as a task last year. Uh, um, even though okay, you know Google also has a search engine on this this, this claim review schema and so on, but um, because it is going to become more important. Because more and more data is being accumulated, more and more claims over time have been kind of fact checked. And now, if you think about it, COVID 19, it's more or less the same claims that are being repeated over and over again, over and over again, over and over again, right? And if you can yeah. just go and detect those, right? So, and this actually means that, that uh, I mean, this is something that fact checkers do. So, certain fact checking organizations are interested in the problem of whether something was, okay. Detecting whether something was previously fact check, you can think of at least three uses. One is to save time to the fact checker, not to fact check something that was already fact checked. That's the most yeah. obvious thing, right? But the other thing I was talking about journalists, right? Again, this can revolutionize journalism because you can put the politician on the spot in real time because it can tell you something that actually has the credibility. It can give you information. He just said something that somebody has fact checked and you know is false. And now you can act based on this. If you just have something that tells you, oh, I think it's 95% likely to be white, you cannot do anything with this information because you don't trust the system, right? And the third thing actually is that they want to make, the fact checkers actually, they want to make a difference. And they want, once they have fact checked something, they don't want people to keep repeating it. They actually want this to make a difference. And they are, some of them are actually contacting politicians and are saying, look, we have fact checked this before when your colleague was saying it, now you keep repeating it, right? Yeah. Why are you doing this? I mean, he's our fact check, right? And kind of some fact check organizations are doing this. They're actively act reaching out to, you know, important people and saying, why are you saying this? It's not true, we have fact checked it. Because they want to make a general difference, not just fact checking and put it down on one website, right? And, and you can think the same thing of, of, of uh, COVID-19. Yeah. There are certain claims have been debunked Okay, how can we make sure that if people keep repeating them, we actually kind of show them, look, this was fact-checked before. And this is kind of, you know, by comparing to previously fact-checked claims of making a link. Yes, I think it, 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 this way of repeating the same claim, okay, is um, in Spanish, we have a, a proverb that says, uh, uh, 
Um, Alfred, I have to translate. Uh, ah, yo, yo, yo puedo hablar español. Ah, bien. Sí, es la sí. um, uh, miente, que algo queda. Miente, so, uh, miente. make a lie yes. that uh, algo queda, no? So, yeah. uh, so, yes, it's a way to uh, repeat the same claim, okay? Uh, when you're repeating the same idea, okay? Although there are, uh, 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 for instance, in politics here in Spain, okay, when there are a politician that make, okay, this is starting to be investigated by the judge, okay? So, uh, okay, you know, the first day, all the newspapers, okay, make the first page. So that guy is, is going to be investigated. But then, okay, the judge says, okay, that guy is uh, innocent. Then you don't have any first page again. So and any people is going to, 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 to fact check, okay, all the, yeah, yeah that is uh, okay. That is uh, it's how media is, okay. Um, it's a, uh, I think it's part of this way of repeating the same claim in order to make propaganda, in order to, uh, to broadcast, okay, the, 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 this uh, fake uh, information or misinformation. So, Presla, right. I think that it's uh, too long also for you, okay? <laughs> Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for your kindness to, 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 uh, ask, to answer to, to all the questions. Um, it was a fantastic uh, uh, talk. So thank you very much. Uh, I guess that uh, we can finish the recording. Yeah. Thank you. For